right, welcome everybody. So it's like good to see everybody, some new faces, some old faces. Um, this is so exciting for me. Uh, I'm pretty new to the organization. Um, and this is the first time that we've had all the clubs together <laughs> since I've been here. And I think that that is so exciting. Um, when I joined the organization, and I, I didn't really, you know, the, what, the, what the clubs are. I'm still a little bit foggy about that. So I hope today will um, clarify it for myself and others. But it, these clubs that the society has really are unique. Um, they, uh, they, they are under the umbrella of the organization, but they do function a little bit independently. They have their own programs, uh, speakers, field trips, uh, events. And it really is an opportunity for you to take a deeper dive into a specific subject. Um, and they're also on the cutting edge of real science. So for instance, and I know that maybe Tom will talk about this, but our, the Herp Club, which are amphibians and reptiles, were played an integral role in the Maryland um, uh, amphibian atlas and, and mapping out all of the animals, not only this, the one that just finished up in the 2000s, but the ones that were in, I think, Tom, it was in the 1960s was the first one or 70s, um, but they were involved with that as well. Charlie has um, more of the history of the organization um, and the clubs and can speak to that. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a newbie, so I'm going to be learning along the way. But they are a unique aspect of the organization. And to become a member of a club, you have to become a member of the organization. And it's a great organization to be a member of. As I mentioned before, it began in 1929. So we're not new kids on the block. We have been around and are caretakers and stewards of the uh, vast collection of Maryland and Baltimore's natural history. Um, we're gonna start off today with learning about our newest club, which is archaeology. And I'm going to let, um, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I'm going to make you co-host right now. So you go on the recording and you can go ahead and share your screen. And I'd like to welcome Ilka to talk about archaeology club. All right, let me see if I can get this going here. Come on. Cool. There we go. Yay. I'm so excited. I'm very excited to um, share with you guys tonight about the Archaeology Club. And I'm really interested in learning more about the other clubs as well, because I've heard bits and pieces here and there. But um, I'm sure this will be enlightening for me tonight. Um, so thank you for letting me have this, have the floor first. Um, this is our mission statement, and that's a whole lot of words, but it does adequately describe it, but I'm going to break it down for you to make it more interesting. So uh, the Archaeology Club was founded in 2019, um, which is not that long ago, but it feels like it was like forever ago in the, in the time before. Um, but we are part of the Natural History Society of Maryland, so that's wonderful because we can use their structure um, both physical and um, online, you know, technical, that type of thing. Um, and we also get to use their people, like the wonderful Bronwyn, who's running this tonight and has all this knowledge and taught me how to do this stuff. Um, I am the president. I'm Elka Knubbel. And we are very privileged to have two club mentors who are professional archaeologists. They are also curators at the Natural History Society of Maryland. Um, Dr. Lisa Krauss and Jason Schellenhammer, who are just the cutest little married archaeology couple that I know. Um, we have a club outreach coordinator is April. She's over in the picture by herself. And uh, we have two positions that are open. If you guys are interested, let me know, vice president and treasurer. So um, we basically cover just 
not that we're excluding everyone, but just logistically, um, Baltimore County and Baltimore City, there's probably enough archaeology within this space to last us for at least the rest of my natural life. Um, so it's not that we're excluding anybody, we just are focused more on Baltimore. And what we're trying to teach is proper archaeological techniques. And that includes not just the excavation um, and the one picture with the uh, pink flags, that is a shovel test pit survey that we did. Um, so we're teaching the, the uh, excavation techniques, but also the ethics um, and the artifact preservation, which is one of the most important things of archaeology. And that's where you, you learn so much from. Um, archaeology is a destructive science. So as we're digging, as we're going down, we are destroying what is there. So that is the need that we are so specific and we're so detailed about documenting, documenting, documenting. Um, where did something come from? Where, ex and we're talking where exactly did it come from? Because when you take all these pieces and you put it together, you start to have a picture of what you've been um, excavating. Um, other than an interest in archaeology, there really is no requirement. Other, well, you do have to be a member of the archaeology club and you do have to be a member of the Natural History Society, but um, you don't have to have any experience, you don't have to have any knowledge, just an interest in archaeology. And uh, as you can see, that's me and my little later hosen digging on my dad's place. So there really is no experience necessary in our group and there's no age limit. Um, now, people have mentioned to me that they don't necessarily feel comfortable going into the field. And I understand that. I've had Lyme's disease once. I don't want it again. We also have uh, labs, archaeology labs that we do at Natural History in Overly. And uh, that's fascinating in itself. And you learn so much. We do um, cleaning and the cataloging of artifacts. Oh what we do and what we have done in the past uh, since 2019 we had a wonderful lecture by dr eric klein on his uh, uh, archaeological site in israel called tel capri um, dr klein is a professor at george washington university um, he is also a prolific author i have a bunch of his books on my shelf and he's also one of the nicest people I've ever met in the field. Um, usually when they get that high up, I guess in any field, they, they tend to be a little bit more, well, he's, he's very, very nice and he's very willing to share his information. Um, we also did a trip, a field trip to Antietam and we had Jason Schellenhammer, who is, I said, the professional archeologist and he shared with us his experiences and showed us sites because he actually worked at Antietam in a professional capacity for four years. So that was really fascinating, some of the stuff that he could show us and really broaden our, our depth and understanding of our uh, national battlefield. Um, and we also had, uh, right before the COVID, we had a cemetery workshop, which gathered a lot of attention and people really enjoyed it um, to the point where people were a little upset that they had missed it um, they found out about it after the fact. So, you know, it may be that we do another one of those at some point. We did do our um, one survey. It was our first one. We were approached by the Baltimore Environmental Police to help um, actually to do a survey for them. And it was at the Glen Ellen Castle, which you may be familiar with. It's in the Lock Raven Reservoir. And the picture up there is, of course, an, an older picture. Um, it was pretty much demolished by 1929. So one of the reasons that um, the police wanted us to come out there and do this is our goals were to actually document it as an archeological site, which we have with the Maryland Historical Trust. And um, the next thing we wanna do is put up a sign, like one of those um, side uh, highway signs that explain to people what this site is because they would rather people not dig there. Um, I went out in April, I think it was, because I wanted to take some more pictures um, and somebody had been digging there again. So if we have a sign up there, Luke feels like, you know, people are like, oh, okay, I understand what this is and I don't have to dig it myself. So 
So one of the cool things, and I'm going to do a, a talk on this in November, um, our monthly meeting in November on Glen Ellen, but I just wanted to show you some of the stuff we found was really cool. So um, there were windows in the Glen Ellen Castle, and those windows were actually obtained by the people that built the cloisters in the mid-20s, mid-1920s. Um, because they wanted to put it in their building. So if you go to the cloisters, if you ever have a chance and it's open again, um, those are like two story windows there and they're just fascinating to see it, especially with the connection that we had to Glen Ellen. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. And I just wanna, one of the really cool things about archeology span is how much you can learn from just a little bit that you find. So we had found this shirt, which is on the left, um, it was clay, we figured it was some kind of liquid container. And if you look closely, you can see it looks like the letters are U and M. So our first guess was that it was some kind of rum bottle. So in archeology, span we meet the most interesting people and people have like this little niche that they know everything about this one particular thing. And one of those people in Baltimore is uh, Ernie Dimmler. You guys may know him. He's the curator of the Bromo Seltzer Tower down in, um, down in Baltimore. Um, so he knows everything that there is to know about bottles. So I sent this picture to him and said, hey Ernie, you know, do you know anything about this? Well, bippity boppity boo, two days later he comes back and he goes, yeah, this is a seltzer water bottle from the Duchy of Nassau. So I'm like, what? Where's Nassau? Well, it turns out that I was thinking Nassau, Bahamas. This Duchy of Nassau was a, uh, independent German state in the Kingdom of Prussia, and it only existed from 1806 to 1866. Um, and that the, at that time in the mid 60s, around the Civil War era, people on the higher economic scale would import their seltzer water from the, Euro almost at the European Union, from Europe, and um, because it was very trendy, it was thought to be uh, like a tonic and it helped with your digestion and all this kind of stuff. So um, this is probably, this was probably used. I mean, we can never directly link it to, but it could have been used by the family that lived in Glen Ellen uh, right after or during the Civil War. So I thought that was pretty neat. And then of course we had our big plans and uh, those were our plans on the left and then 2020 hit. That's a little archeology span humor. Uh, so we do have some Zoom meetings. We have October 19th is going to be the Herring Run Archaeological Project. That's Jason and Lisa's, which is really fascinating. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk November 13th about Glen Ellen. Um, and some gonna, of the things I'm going to inter in interrupt you just for a second, Ilka. Sure. If, if you don't mind. Um, those two meetings, the two Zoom meetings that are coming up, those are going to be open meetings so that you, they're for members of the archaeology club as well as non-members. And we're doing that right now as part of um, our COVID uh, situation. And beginning though in January, the meetings will change to go back to just being for the club members only as a club benefit. But right now we're trying to um, get the word out and encourage as many people as possible to join the clubs um, and, it, and we're doing that by having open meetings. Cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and this is one of the things, the, the cool things that are coming up and that's why people should join is uh, we would, we'd love to get Ernie up to do a Burma Seltzer lecture on all the battles. He has the largest collection of Burma Seltzer bottles in the world and he knows more about Burma Seltzer and Baltimore than you could even think one person could know. So um, that's gonna be a lecture that would have happened by now, I'm sure, if it hadn't been for COVID. Uh, we'd also like to take a field trip, do a kayak trip on the Susquehanna River to see the petroglyphs up there. Um, we would like to do a flint napping demonstration to see just how hard and how much practice it takes to make one of these projectile points that we find um, and have more of an appreciation for it. And one of the big projects we have we're trying to get together. We're in, working in conjunction with the Baltimore Environmental Police. We want to do a um, archaeological survey of the Lock Raven Dam Workers Camp. Um, a lot of archaeology, sometimes in the past, we've been criticized because we document um, the lives of basically what were rich um, people. Now, 
we do find more material remains when you have a huge house like Glen Ellen and things like that. But we want to document the lives of people who are less well known to history. We want, we want to incorporate all of, of people that lived in Baltimore. Um, so using this, uh, using the uh, artifacts and landscapes and the con contextual analysis of the dam workers camp, uh, we'll be able to tell the, the story of the immigrants and the people on the lower economic scale that helped build the dam, who's, um, I don't know if it's next year or 2022, it'll be the 100 year anniversary of the dam. So it's gonna, I think it'll coincide really nicely with that. So that's, um, that's some of the things we have in store. And if you have any other information, there's my email and you can hit me up on there if you have questions. Does anybody have any questions right now for Ilka? We'll take a couple of minutes for each one. Otherwise, you can write them in the chat box and or contact her afterwards. Oops. All right. Thank you, Ilka. That was fascinating. I You're want to welcome. join. Can I join? Absolutely. <laughs> Are there currently any kids in the club? Sarah wants to know. Um, we've had a couple teenagers, but we haven't had kids that are probably younger than 14. But like I said, there's no age restriction. If they have the attention span and they want to come and join us, by all means, we would love to have some. Um, I am actually going to be a grandmother for the first time. And I was showing, let me show you this real quick. Um, so I will be bringing my grandson for sure, because I already got him his first archaeological onesie, <laughs> which I thought was awfully cute. And my son's already told me I'm limited to one archaeological onesie. So that makes me sad, but it's okay. And as a reminder, the archaeological club is the newest of the club. So it just started in 2019. It was just getting started until then, boom. So um, I'm sure, you know, if, if things had progressed normally, there would have been more kids, but everybody is welcome in all of the, in all of the clubs. All right. Now we're going to turn it over to Adrian and he's going to take us back in time a little bit farther than Ilka did um, because he is a, the head of the Fossil Club. Adrian, just before you get started, I just want to uh, change, make you a, a co-host so you get um, on the video on the recording. All right, Adrian. So I can see me and I can see you. I'm gonna presume it's all working. Yes? Yes, we're all good. Cool. So Elka, you are a tough act to follow, uh, but, but we'll kind of wing it. Um, and you might've seen some scrambling around because I was trying to avoid my grandchildren <laughs> and all the noise that they're making, so. We'll work this out. So Fossil Club, I, I, you call me the head of the Fossil Club, and I'm um, kind of surprised by that, actually. <laughs> so, because I thought it was Nick, but uh, but we're okay. So uh, I don't have a, a formal presentation, just kind of going off some notes. And I, th uh, I think Fossil Club's been around for maybe a couple years now. Uh, kind of the brainchild of a bunch of folks who recognized that natural history has a large fossil collection. And it could probably provide an outlet for a bunch of folks who share that interest. And that was absolutely correct. We've been meeting at the museum, first Wednesdays of the month, 7.30. And uh, the club role, the membership role, the email list uh, keeps growing. We're up to about 75 people or so. Um, and these open meetings that we've been having have been wonderful. And I would uh, put in a plug that they continue uh, because we, we bring in folks that uh, I had no idea existed and they keep, we keep stumbling into each other, uh, new folks in the club. So uh, 
one of the things we do is we leverage the contacts that a lot of the current members have and we bring in speakers. These speakers have uh, brought us uh, a wealth of good, good experiences, good meetings, good talks. They include folks like Stephen Godfrey uh, and John Nance from Calvert Marine Museum, uh, several folks who are associated with the Smithsonian, uh, a lot of people who are not just collectors, but published uh, collectors, some of whom I think we'd, we'd call them downright professionals, in addition to Stephen Godfrey, who probably carries the title of something like state paleontologist. Um, and a lot of the nicest people you'd want to meet. The, there's a lot of folks in the club who have given talks. Um, George Spica has given talks, uh, Chris Luzier, uh, Tom Piscitelli, and we've been pulling together talks that emphasize different things in the Natural History Society's collection. And um, the other person I'd call out is Mason Hintermeister, uh, because this kid has, uh, this kid, this young man, has uh, proven himself to have the, not only a wealth of knowledge, but a wealth of contacts. Everyone I talk to already knows him. And um, he's pulled together some phenomenal PowerPoints on things like sharks and shark evolution and collecting fossils and what is a fossil and, and that sort of thing. And it's been uh, incredibly useful. The other thing besides speakers and uh, that we do at the meetings, and meetings are fantastically informal, right? Um, is we schedule and pull off and arrange for fossil collecting trips. And uh, this is, a, a by and large, uh, and I think you could say this of anyone in natural history, this is a group of people who love being outside. And uh, fossil collecting trips is a big deal. Uh, we try to schedule them as often as possible. They even kind of sort of show up in the raffles, the raffle that just completed. Uh, we've done a lot of fossil collecting trips to places like Stratford Hall in Virginia. Uh, the Pendix Quarry in right near uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, St. Clair, which is a fern collecting site in Pennsylvania. Um, we've done tours of the Calvert Marine Museum. And before we were kind of shut down by COVID, we had several on the schedule for uh, basically backroom tours of the Smithsonian and things like that. Again, leveraging these speakers and contacts. Um, so we're constantly looking for new things to do. And the cool thing to, to get back to Stratford just a little bit, Stratford Hall is Lee's birthplace. It's on the Virginia side of the Potomac River. Uh, it is next door to Washington's birthplace, Westmoreland State Park, and then Lee's birthplace. Those three huge sites prevented that entire area from being developed. So it's a phenomenally pristine place. It's a, a lot of fun if you enjoy being outdoors on a river. And it's a pretty special fossil collecting place. It's Miocene uh, fossils, Calvert Formation. Another place that we go slightly younger is uh, around Little Cove Point in, uh, in Maryland. Miocene fossils again, St. Mary's Formation. And again, leveraging contacts that we have of people who can let us in. Uh, so Stratford not just lets us in, they, the place is closed to all but professional groups. So if, if you go by yourself, you nowhere near have the ac kind of access that you can get when you go with us. So uh, a lot of fun. People bring their stuff back to meetings in a pre-COVID era. And we talk about what everybody found. We, we kind of, it's almost like show and tell and discuss things. And, and uh, usually there's someone in the room or a speaker who can identify what people have found and, uh, and put it in context. Uh, we've also put on a, uh, what we called Shark Fest, which was uh, to go in conjunction with uh, Shark Week and et cetera. And that was spearheaded by some of the members, uh, Jerry Cuffley and Aaron Baker. 
and it has grown. Uh, we were supposed to do version number three this year. We're trying to figure out how we do that in a post-COVID uh, era, but uh, we're on the verge uh, and we'll pull that off. And we, just, just to give you a flavor, it was for adults and for kids. We had speakers from Calvert Marine Museum, from the National Aquarium, along with a uh, giant sandbox uh, that kids could uh, sift through the sand and find shark teeth. Um, so meanwhile, I've been putting aside sand from some of my favorite fossil collecting places that is full of shark's teeth, that is uh, kid friendly, and we will do this again and figure this out. Um, so we're, we're kind of geared up for that next next thing. Um, I'm embarrassed that I'm not wearing a Fossil Club t-shirt, uh, which I should have on. It's, it's something that uh, the group enjoys. And the other piece is uh, I'm constantly amazed by the talents uh, of the folks in the, in the club. They range from people who are interested in fossils to people who are professional uh, fossil people, professional paleontologists. And it in, would include, I wanna highlight one individual who's in some of the other clubs and, and a natural history member. Um, and that's uh, Brittany Roger. And she's produced YouTube videos uh, on the drawing zoo. And for instance, she just cranked one out on drawing a fossil uh, that we're trying to do with the Enoch Pratt Library uh, as a way of giving them something that they can use to engage kids, uh, part of that effort. So tons of stuff going on. Uh, like I said, it, it, the, the group keeps growing and um, we've, we've really enjoyed it. So. I think I think that's about all that's off the top of my head. All right, Adrian, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Adrian about the Fossil Club or um, in mea culpa about Nick? I don't. I consider him kind of the governor, and he's a, he's got his hands in all of the different uh, clubs and expertise. So, um, I, uh, um, Nick, do you want to add anything about the Fossil Club? In in Nick's defense. We have never purposely have never held an election for an officer. It is phenomenally informal. Uh, we're purposely uh, it's a, it's an open group, um, and and we're having fun with it. There was a question about children, and at, at a function, somebody asked if children were welcome at any of the clubs, and I, I asked the person, "Do you have children?" Well, yeah. I said, well, if you have children and you don't bring them, you can't come. So we, we, we welcome everybody. And the wealth of knowledge that we have is wonderful. Um, and there might be some laughs, but we're only going to laugh when everybody leaves. There are no dumb questions. We'll, we welcome everyone, and everyone gives freely of their knowledge. It's a, it's a real friendly group and a lot of fun. Maybe, maybe one last thought. So one of the cool things about, you mentioned, you know, clubs as part of natural history. And what fascinates me is where things overlap. For instance, with the archaeology club, uh, I'm fascinated and we've developed a collection of shark's teeth that have been used as implements, right? And there's another group at natural history is interested in identifying plants we got a lot of fossil plants in the collection and we, we keep adding more. And again, there's a, a, a way to connect things. So we're always, I think, looking for uh, the, the intersection, if you will, of, of a lot of these interests, which again, sparks the interests of other folks and, and keeps it a lot of fun. And if you're a kid and you come on one of our fossil collecting trips, for instance, if we're looking for shark's teeth, my job is to make sure that that kid finds shark's teeth before they go home. And we teach them how to do it. It's an eyeball training exercise, training thing. Awesome. Thank you guys. Any, any other questions? 
Can I ask? Uh, hi. Hi. I want to just ask whether there will be another fossil collecting trip this year, maybe. Absolutely. Uh, we just did two of them to Stratford Hall in September. We are trying to schedule some more. There is a PG County uh, collecting trip that's on the calendar for, I think it's October 10th. Um, and as we can throw them together, they, they land on the calendar. And uh, the, the one in PG County, I think, is limited to a small group of people, Fossil Club members, uh, because it's a very small site. Uh, but we'll go back. And Stratford is, yeah. uh, there might be a limitation on the number of folks who, who go on a trip, but um, for all purposes at that site, uh, you can collect fossils as far from a distance wise, as far as the eye can see to the left and to the right. So, and if you'd won the raffle, you'd get to go on a fossil trip too. So we're working on that stuff. We're talking about getting a trip to uh, Seven Stars, Avian. Yeah. Look for trial bikes. So we'll post that pretty soon, also. Yeah, and if and the members of the club are the first ones to to know about the trips and get on get on the the list quick first. So that's a good thing. Right. They they do fill up fast. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what do inside of a circle look like? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. What does like, the go ahead. inside of a circle look like? What does inside a circle look like? Well, so the good thing about collecting fossils is I can truthfully say no animals were harmed in the collection collecting of this specimen. So I've personally never seen the inside of a shark. Having said that, um, I can tell you what shark teeth look like and what shark disc look like. I already and, know what shark teeth look like. And, and a snout from a shark, but those are really the only three parts of sharks that become fossils. Thank you. But I bet we could find someone in Natural History Society who, who has that answer. Mm -hmm. All right, Adrian. We're before gonna... before Adrian goes, um, the person who just asked a question: Did you want to see a shark's tooth? Have you never seen one before? I actually have some in a tiny sandbox, and okay. well, like real ones, but I don't know what inside a shark looks like. Oh, that's a good I question. Never seen the inside. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch uh, uh, gears and we're going to head to the present um, for uh, some living animals and their Herp Club, who focuses on uh, reptiles and amphibians. I'm going to make Tom a co host. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, Tom, it's up to okay. you. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We're good? Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, unlike Adrian, I remembered to wear my Herb Club t-shirt today. So uh, those, those are available on uh, uh, a Teespring store that the club has. But um, my name is Tom and I have the um, privilege of um, leading Herb Club. The Herb Club um, uh, has a long history as well, just almost as long, um, if not as long as the Natural History Society itself. Um, hey Tom, you're kind of breaking up. Do you want to turn off your um, video feed to give you some more juice? Let me see there. Let me try that for a bit. Is that better? Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, I, f I first became acquainted with the um, Natural History Society and the, and, the, and the Herpological Society, as it was called then, uh, when I was at the Baltimore Zoo um, Reptile Department. 
um, many, many years ago. Um, we held our meetings in the Reptile House at that time, and that was before the Natural History Society had its current building uh, on Bel Air Road. Uh, so our group is dedicated to the conservation globally of reptiles and amphibians. Um, we support responsible herpetal culture, which is the keeping and breeding of reptiles and amphibians uh, as pets, as a hobby. And the biggest thing we do is promote education about reptiles and amphibians, um, which are actually one of the most endangered groups of animals that we have currently globally over, uh, we've lost over 3% of the frogs and toad species worldwide um, to, and amphibians, reptiles are grouped in, uh, in this group of animals that are, are highly endangered due to habitat loss, due to um, pollution. There are several uh, emerging fungal diseases that are affecting reptiles and amphibians, uh, which is all most likely fallout from global warming, um, over collection for the pet and food trade worldwide. So this is a group of animals that really, really needs um, conservation and conservation comes from education. Um, and that's how we uh, get these animals to be appreciated. Um, so we have um, a really, a, we have a growing club. Um, currently, I think we're over 50 members last time I checked my spreadsheet. So what we do uh, in non-COVID time, I'm gonna hit, hit the video again, see if we're okay. If I start breaking up, let me know. Um, so in non-COVID times, we have our monthly meetings the first Thursday of every month uh, at 7 p.m at the Natural History Society building. Um, in these times, we've, had, we've hosted a few Zoom meetings uh, coming up in November, on November 19th. Uh, this is another open meeting, so non-members can um, join the Zoom. Scott Smith from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources will be speaking about uh, terrapins, uh, which is kind of an iconic Maryland turtle uh, in our uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and that again is open to everybody, so we encourage folks to uh, join us for that. Uh, we do field trips, local field trips to find herps, uh, which are reptiles and amphibians, so we go out into the field and um, find all sorts of uh, fun species. We get hands on, uh, like photograph them, uh, learn how these animals live in the wild. One of the best things we do in the spring, um, especially for young folks, is we go to vernal pools in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain, in the woods, and you're surrounded by migrating wood frogs and spotted salamanders and all these wonderful creatures that you never ever see um, because most people don't do things as crazy as stand in the woods in the pouring rain at midnight, but we get to do that. And as a club member, you can join us and it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, one of the wonderful things about this club and about all the clubs in uh, the Natural History Society, uh, we are very inclusive. We have folks with PhDs that are professional curators. We have uh, staff people from the aquarium and we have eight, nine, 10 year old children that just had their first pet snake. And we all come together during the meetings. Uh, we learn from each other. I always, I'm the advocate that learning is, is a two way street. Um, it's not just from uh, us old folks down. I learned so much just by you know talking to the kids that, that or either in the field finding stuff on their own because they're lower to the ground, they see more frogs than toads. Um, so it, that that kids are always welcome at our meetings. Kids are always welcome on our field trips. Um, and like they said, not welcome but encouraged. We we want them there because those kids are the future of conservation uh, in our country. Um, so we we really want to encourage uh, families to become members and uh, learn about the herbs with us. Um, we have, um, let me see here, I'm just checking the news. Brian, we did mention the um, MARA, which is the Maryland Amphibian and Re Reptile Out, you can see that, right? Maryland Amphibian Reptile Out Atlas. This was a, uh, a joint um, effort by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Natural History Society of Maryland uh, to basically catalog all the reptile and amphibian species 
and uh, distribution throughout the state and compare it with historical records. The, the most comprehensive one was in 1975, Herb Harris did a distributional survey um, of the reptiles and amphibians in Maryland and DC. The uh, Maryland Atlas, the most recent one was 2018, um, was a, it's, it's a wonderful publication and is it, I don't know if it's still available from us on our website or not, uh, but it is, okay. So if, if you're- Not on the website. It's not, it's not available on the website, but we do have signed copies that are available for sale, yeah. So if you're gonna buy one, assuming after COVID you come and buy one from us, but it absolutely, a terrific publication. Again, because um, it's important to know where these animals are now and also where they're not, where because they may have been there five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they're not there now. Um, why? Um, so but these are um, all issues that, you know, we're big on uh, citizen science uh, when, our, when our groups go out and we're, and we're looking for critters in the field. Um, that's all valuable data. Um, we, we're, I think herpetology is unique in that we get to go out and actually get hands on a lot of our animals. Whereas if you're a mammal person, you rarely get to like pick up the bear or the mountain lion and check it out and take close up photos. Or if you're a bird person, you can't just kind of pluck the birds out of the sky. Um, us her folks get to get hands on and we get pooped on a lot, but that's just those with the, you know, those with the joy of picking up the snake or the salmon or whatever it may be. Um, I probably forgot a million different things, but um, our club has been growing and we want to keep growing and we welcome new members all the time and uh, hopefully we will get back together and until then uh, hopefully we can all get together on the, on the Zoom meetings. I'm trying to uh, line something up for maybe uh, December or January uh, for uh, Exiling mine in Texas about horn lizard conservation. So we have a lot of exciting things coming up. Uh, the sky's the limit. We're only limited by the passion and creativity of, of our members. So the more we have, the, the better off we get. Oh, the thing I did forget, uh, we do a um, electronic newsletter uh, for the club members only. Uh, I'm fishing up it's one, hopefully it'll go out in the next couple of days. So if you join tonight or tomorrow, you'll get the newest uh, e-newsletter. And we also have a closed Facebook page or we have a club only Facebook page for uh, paid members to share photos, um, field trip ideas, uh, uh, care tips for their pet herps, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So um, lots of benefits to membership as well as just supporting the Natural History Society as a whole. questions all right thank you Tom we're gonna quickly move over to um, Constance in the Lepidoptera Club and if you're not familiar with Lepidoptera Club it's the order of moths and butterflies uh, Constance you ready you gotta unmute I thought I was. Hey. So I'm even more informal than I guess any of the other people. Um, I'm really winging it here. Um, Nick can jump in and help me if I miss something. Um, but we, like many of the other clubs, are informal. Um, everyone is invited. Anybody who enjoys seeing something truly magical. Um, basically what we do, um, Nick and I started the club about five years ago and, um, the goal for the club is to teach people how to raise a caterpillar uh, successfully into either a butterfly or a moth. And, um, we have, for the years past when we were able to get together, uh, we would provide certain species two members and here's an example of one this is a cecropia moth this pretty girl came out in may and she laid a bunch of eggs for us and so um club members can you put her closer to the screen constance sure that is north america's largest moth it's called a cecropia 
So we teach people the proper husbandry, how to take care of it so that um, you give the caterpillar what it needs as it would be in nature, the proper host plants, how to clean the cages, how to take care of them at every stage of their development. And then once they become adults to, you know, let them go, or if you choose to rebreed them, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so, um, for the club, um, we've sold cages to uh, provide cages for people on um, their proper cages to raise them in so that they're safe because um, they do get uh, lots of parasites and predators. Um, and we've raised money for natural history that way. We um, have done raffles for the club. Um, we've done field trips to like Cromwell and um, the gunpowder to search for caterpillars and for adults. And uh, we do have a closed Facebook page. This year for COVID, it definitely quieted down a lot. We had about um, probably at the end of 2019, we had um, like 75 members. But because of COVID and because of a, such a hands on club with, you know, information and um, caterpillars and such. Um, we have provided caterpillars to members this year, but it's just been pretty much um, porch pickup kind of a thing. Um, and also the club, the LEP club runs from the end of May through the end of October. And we were meeting at um, Natural History on the last Thursday of the month. We did have speakers come in, um, a master gardener, Deborah Carmen from PA came in and um, we've had several other people come in and talk and some club members have brought in some amazing uh, butterflies in their collections and we've shared that. Um, it's very, meetings are very busy. I mean, there's so much going on between the passing of information about what people are raising and what people are bringing in. And um, so it's a lot of fun, lots of kids. And that's what, it's just, it's such a magical experience to see the transformation. So um, Nick, did I leave anything out? Oh, we have to unmute Nick. <laughs> I can't hear you, Nick, unmute. Uh, I just like to add that kids have a wonderful experience here. The first time they come in, as well as adults, they, they kind of hold back. They don't want to ask any questions. And we welcome everybody. We try to get everybody involved, find out what their experiences are with different animals they raise, and watch kids come in and be so excited. Mr. Nick, Mr. Nick, we raised five lunas last week. It's, I mean, the, the, the excitement is palpable. Um, the kids come in. We've got one kid that um, is probably five years old, and he answered all the questions that were asked. And I looked at him. I said, why are you sitting back there? You need to sit up at the big table. And when he comes in, that's where he sits. Uh, he's, his mother is a biologist, and he's, uh, he's pretty precocial. He really knows his stuff. But it's everyone is welcome. Um, information that we give is, is free to everyone, we take people out in the field and show them the field plants, that the, the host plants that these animals feed on. We've got people that have been here for a couple of years that show other people outside of the club. So there's a it's a it's a really nurturing atmosphere. People have a lot of fun. They look forward to coming. Kids that come in, I'm talking infants come in. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a great time. Yeah. We also provide, um, as an aside, we also provide uh, caterpillars um, to Irvine Nature Center and to um, Ledoux Topiary Gardens Butterfly House. So we're connected pretty heavily with those two places. And, um, one, and we've also had people come in to show like, um, We've had Herring Run Nursery come in with native plants and how important it is to plant native in your own yard and not use pesticides because these animals are an incredibly important part of where we live. And they're also, we work in conjunction with Audubon because Maryland wouldn't be a flyway if it wasn't for caterpillars. The birds would not be here. So um, 
they're a very important part of our natu of nature. And um, if you want birds, you need caterpillars. So um, it's- yeah, pe People ask that often, what good are these, these uh, moths? They eat trees. And, and my response typically is when you look at birds that are nesting on your property, when they're coming back with food for the babies, invariably they're caterpillars. And most of these caterpillars lay between three to 500 eggs, some of the big Saturnids, and most of those don't make it, but they, they're instrumental in feeding a lot of other animals. Yeah. So, you know, it's not just raising, it's, it's opening awareness to nature in general. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned and, and people take a lot home with them. Thank you, Nick and Constance. Um, for that, we're gonna we're gonna. I know that time is running a little bit short, but we're gonna run over to um, Linda, and she's going to talk us to us about mosses. Yes, and I need to have access to a PowerPoint presentation. Yep you you have your own PowerPoint, right? I do. Yeah, just could you can do um, share screen. Right. Can everybody see this? Yes. Great. Well, this is easy because everybody loves mosses. If you ask people, everybody nods when I ask them about mosses. And really, what's not to like? Um, they've been around for over 350 million years. Long time. And they look pretty much the same as they did early on. They grow in all sorts of places. They come in a wide variety of colors. So on this slide, there's probably seven or eight different kinds of mosses. And really, they're just plain beautiful. Everybody loves them, and you may need to move your um, the row of, of people in order to see the right side of this slide. Everybody loves them, but they're very small, so it's hard to get to know them beyond a fond pat or a stroke while you're hiking. This one is one of our very small mosses. It, that's uh, my foot is that's the, the the sole of my shoe on the right side. It likes to be um, tucked behind logs across a trail. You'll often see them or tucked between roots. Their size requires you to slow down and look very closely, especially if you wanna learn their names. And those of us who love mosses know that if you learn the names of them, your hikes and trips are always a lot more fun because it's as if you're walking with friends. But even then, even if you're looking closely, it's, um, it's hard to know where to start because there are a lot of different kinds. So that's why in 2007, the Natural History Society of Maryland um, started a monthly moss workshop where people can learn how to observe and identify mosses. We welcome people with all levels of experience and knowledge. Sometimes the kids know a lot more about mosses, not perhaps the scientific facts, but the variety. They will recognize a familiar one from their own backyard. We get together and we help one another learn about mosses using hand lenses, microscopes, lots of books, and, and more recently, online resources. We work to identify the mosses that we found as individuals in our own yards or on trips. We also did an inventory of the Benjamin Banneker Museum uh, down in Noella, in a county park in Noella, um, and because that's where we used to meet. But now, well, at least before COVID, we were meeting at the Natural History Society's building in Overly.
and we have a great time in the process. Um, I didn't include a photo, but often the, any photos that I've taken <laughs> looks like a row of people with their butts in the air because you, they have their noses to the ground. But we do have a good time. Because of COVID, uh, we haven't been inside with one another, sharing the mosses with the help of microscopes. A lot of the features of, of mosses are very small and you do need a microscope to tease out down to the species level. Um, but in response to COVID, we are planning some uh, trips to look closely at them in the field. And about half of the mosses you see in the field, you can get pretty close to a name. This happens to be one of our, our it is our largest moss. It's called Clinaceum americanum, and it grows in, in pretty wet areas. This, uh, we live in Lutherville, and uh, this one grows on the downward slope of, of the seminary on Seminary Avenue. Uh, which is now a, a, a continuing care facility. But if you go there, you can you can sneak onto their campus through the through the uh, stone gates down near the light rail, and about 100 feet in on the left, you'll find a whole whole area, and it and it it lasts because people mow and they don't hit it. It's so short. So I encourage you to stay tuned to, to the Natural History Society's meetup site and our website, where we'll be posting upcoming details about uh, moss hikes. And this is, uh, I leave you with this wonderful image because it was a, um, a decorative piece in a very beautiful garden in Alaska. And uh, apparently the mosses started to take over an old pair of boots in the, in the yard. And so the woman brought it in and used it as a, as a, garden, um, as a garden holder. So um, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody. Um, before we um, end for the evening, I do want to mention that, again, that all of the four clubs have private um, closed Facebook groups that you get access to that it's really forming a community. And if you want to, if you're a fossil, you're, you, you, you're with your people. Um, and I, I would say that the, the Moss Club also has a, has a closed Facebook page called Maryland Mossers. Oh. And it's, so um, anybody who's interested um, can join us there. Thank you. I did not know that. Um, the question that we get is, how do you, you become a member? How do you do that? Because I know that everybody wants to become a member. So I'm going to share my screen. Before you do that, um, Tom, oh. um, do you know that uh, you have one more one more group that's to share? The what's, the what's this plant? I was going to say something about the what's this plant. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. What's this plant? <laughs> I'm sorry. And again, we're we're sort of hidden because we're not really a we're not really a club, but we've been a group that's been meeting since 2014, and we've met 147 times, uh, and. And again, this was a this is a group at the Natural History Society, whose whose purpose is to help people learn how to identify plants beyond the field guide. You know, everybody, there's a pent up interest in society for this. If you go on Facebook, there's over two two hundred thousand people on one Facebook page. That's a worldwide page, just people wanting to know the names of plants. So anyway, what we've been doing is basically. Um, uh, uh, crowdsourcing the mentorship and on two Mondays of every month the second and the fourth we usually get together between two and uh, between two for two hours between seven and nine and people can come just come to get a plant identified we've had people come in who just had a weed in a garden we've had student researchers working on their New York City Parks program, and we've had um, we've had people in professional uh, professionals doing wetland delineate, delineations, having trouble identifying a plant. So just a broad range of people. But the purpose is was to have a crossroads where they can learn from other experts. Uh, Judy Fulton, Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa Beecham from Towson University, and Linda and I have been the ones sort of being there doing the, the, the mentorship. But anyway, everything we do 
would get people sick. Because, <laughs> you know, we're sharing plants, we're sharing tweezers, we're sharing hand lenses against their eyes, we're sharing microscopes, um, and we're shoulder to shoulder with each other. Um, we used to say we were, the best thing about the program is that we're shoulder to shoulder with passionate experts. But now we can, now all we can say is that we're within six feet of a passionate expert. All right. So anyway, we're going to be shifting our direction in the short term as well, because we just can't keep doing it the way we are. And we'll be planning some field trips, working on the same kinds of things, but more informally in the field. It won't be as efficient because we just won't have access to all the tools and, and, and we're, we'll be separated while we're there. But we're going to be doing some hikes, focusing on, on winter plants, woody plants in winter, et cetera. So we'll just go with the season and we'll be planning some, some field trips. Now, unfortunately, there's, the trips can't be 20 and 30 people, uh, you know, six feet apart at 20 people, <laughs> we're probably up to an eighth of a mile maybe. Um, so there'll be smaller groups, probably of a dozen people. So we'll probably do it through the meetup site and limit the numbers so that we, we can be. But what has happened with the group is that some people have been coming for the last six years. Uh, and again, it's, that's how you learn the names of plants. It's just more of an incremental process. It's very similar to what's been happening with the moss, the moss group that meets. So anyway, we are in a club but we're sort of functioning somewhat like a club. So we want to let you know that that was happening. And in the meantime, if you have that need of learning how to identify the plant, contact us. We can get you started even outside the arena of the, meeting, the meetings that we're having. So that's it, thank you. No, thank you, Charlie, and I apologize. I didn't realize we were completely forgot about the plant. What's this plant? Um, and we've also started a new Natural History Society of Maryland book club too. And you have to be a member of the society to join the book club. We're going to be targeting, um, uh, hopefully locally, uh, authors and have them be involved with the book club discussions um, at various points through, through the book. Our first book that we're doing is um, by Keith Williams. It's Snorkeling. Oh goodness, did I have that up there on my on my screen? You had it on your originals. I know, and I can't remember what the name is. Snorkeling Mara Streams and Rivers. He's one of the founders of the sport of river snorkeling. Um, he's local. He's an environmental educator uh, at North Bay. He's the, actually the director of North Bay Environmental Education Center. Um, so if you're a member of this society, you can become a member of the book club if that's um, also uh, part of your reading and, uh, and that. So I'm going to share the screen one more time. Hopefully, nope. And this is our website, MarylandNature.org. Has that come up yet? It's not on mine either. Is it just a blank screen? <laughs> Here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now it's a black screen. I'm gonna try it one more time and if it's a problem, I will just uh, talk us through it for a second. Well, heck, 
that's not going to work. It's some the computer's not cooperating with me at this time. But the website is Maryland, uh, uh, MarylandNature.org. And if you go there, maybe Patty, I'll open open your mic and you can talk people through that system. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, so we just um, introduced a new way to purchase memberships because we've been growing um, exponentially with so many people outside of the state and outside of Baltimore um, wanting to become active in our programs uh, and wanting to become members. And then older people who have been members all of a sudden becoming aware of, of our clubs and our programs. Initially, we could only in, um, start memberships when people renewed or purchased a membership. But starting tonight, woot woot, we are going to be able to sell our memberships a la carte through a store on the, um, on the website. So if you were to go along the top of the web page, um, Bronwyn, maybe you can help me. I think it's called uh, Get Involved might be the tab. Mm -hmm. Click on that. And when it drops down, you'll see a drop down menu for club membership. And there's a little outline paragraph for each club describes it. And then there's a, a button at the bottom where it says you can purchase your membership and it takes you to our online store. So the store is where you can purchase your membership for family membership level or an individual level. And the, our system will recognize whether or not you're a member already in the system or not. So you, there's no getting around it. If you're not a NHSM member and you want to buy a membership to the Herb Club, uh, it'll um, immediately charge you $45 for a family or $30 for um, an individual or $5 or $10 for in, if you're already a member. Oh, look at you. Look at you, girl. You got, us, you got it going. There we go. So if you scroll down to the bottom, if you wouldn't mind. Visit store, why is access denied? I'm waiting. It says, please wait. So I'm waiting. Um, in any event, what, what I'll continue on with is that, ah, there you go. So you can also buy your raffle tickets through the store and a membership to each and every club. Bronwyn, if you wouldn't mind clicking on the annual archaeology club membership for family level, And we can demonstrate. Will it let you do that? Can you hear me, Brahman? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, navigate through that that store to purchase your memberships um, and memberships are annual. So even though you're, you're, you might be signing up for a family membership, you will get an automatic renewal notice about that from our software um, and be prompted to automatically renew your NHSM membership. However, the club memberships are seasonal. So they are a uh, calendar year. So anyway, take a look through Familiarize yourself with that. If you have any questions, you can email or call us and I can walk you through it. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. It seems like Bronwyn's frozen. Ways you can hear me? Oh, okay. Well, this is so bizarre because Bronwyn can't. So <laughs> so perhaps I am wrapping up the meeting for, for Bronwyn. Um, we thank everyone for coming. I hope you got a really good overview of the clubs and the, the oh, did I hear a noise from Bronwyn? I'm back. I'm sorry. It got frozen oh, in, frozen somewhere <laughs> in cyberspace and now I'm, I'm back. <laughs> well, I, and I was just babbling on, so that take it from great. here. <laughs> I love technology. But if you have any questions, feel free to email um, bestrong at marylandnature.org and we'll get it right to the right people.
yeah, to answer yeah. the question um, if you're working your way through. And now I um, ask y'all to be ambassadors. So you have all this knowledge, you have to go out and share it with others um, about this wonderful organization. And we hope that we see you um, at one of our upcoming programs very, very, very soon. Thank you. Yes, thanks for your patience too. While we grow and learn under these new circumstances, we're, it's very exciting to learn something new every day. Um, and we're not always good at something the first time. So practice makes perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Well done, well done Bronwyn. Yes, Thanks. very well done. Thanks, everybody. This is going to be great to share with, have on YouTube and everything like that for future. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Good night. Good night. <laughs>